Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm here today with Kyle Hawkins. He's the Deputy Head of Elementary for Student Welfare, and also Ben Sheridan, who's a Learning Innovation Coach. They're both, both at the NIST International School in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, gentlemen, tell us a little bit about NIST. Uh, so NIST is the New International School of Thailand. Uh, we were established in the early 90s um, in uh, working together with the United Nations at that time. Uh, we're a K-12 international school <clears throat> uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, so we're in, right in the city. Um, we've got just under 1,700 students here. About a quarter of them are Thai and the other 75% are, are a real mix. They're coming from about uh, 60 different uh, countries and the families that we serve are mostly coming from uh, embassies, United Nations uh, agencies and other multinational uh, organizations and corporations. Um, and we're a full IB world school. So we, we offer a continuum from kindergarten through to university um, entrance, all um, IB programs uh, culminating in the diploma and then off to uh, universities around the world. So we have a very transient population, but uh, very international. Awesome, thank you. So uh, I think we're focusing on elementary today. What did it look like as NIST shifted all the awesome learning that you all do face-to-face -face for your younger learners into remote and distance learning? What's it been like the last few months? It's been very complex and ever-changing, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to sum it up in a few words, but um, uh, one of the things that we really benefited from was being a country that was impacted by coronavirus very early, but had the school closures happen relatively late compared to other countries. So the, uh, it was quite a while before there was local transmission of the, 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 pan, of the coronavirus here, um, so we actually had time to plan and prepare, which a lot of schools didn't have uh, such a great opportunity in that regard. So uh, we were able to reach out to schools, particularly in China um, and even uh, some other, other schools around the world and draw on some of their experiences of what happens, what kind of experiences do families and children have? Um, how do they respond to the, the changing landscape? And what would you do differently as school leaders and things? So. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the time, there weren't easy, simple answers to those questions, but at least we could anticipate what was coming a little bit and also make sure that we had some of those logistical and operational pieces nailed down early. And I think one of the uh, key things that came through from those other schools was um, uh, don't try to get too creative and innovative right off the beginning. Really. Uh, leverage the technology and the skills and the platforms that you already have in place at your school. Um, nail those down, get your core practices in place, find some sense of the new normal um, and routine, and then you can look to get more creative and innovate. And that's pretty much uh, what we did, although I would imagine some of our uh, teaching staff would, would, would reflect that it felt like change was almost constant all the time. Um, of course, that wasn't what our intent, but these are unparalleled times. And of course, we're going to be experiencing fundamental changes to the way we do work. And like, um, just before checking in, if Ben wants to con contribute anything, I'd just like to say a huge shout out to all of the teachers out there who really like, they had to deal with uh, so much change to the way that they do their jobs. It was really fundamental. And um, overnight, you know, in the world, we can, I think, pat one another on the back saying like we really rose to the challenge and, and we should feel good about that. And I think we'll reflect positively on this for years to come in, in many ways. Cool. So I know that, you know, NIST has never been known for, you know, sort of low level uninteresting learning, right? So you all have a reputation for doing some really interesting things with students. So uh, what does that look like as you all have shifted? What are some great examples you can maybe share with other folks? Um, so, yeah, we, we had many of the same experiences and challenges that a lot of schools had, but we had, there, there are a couple of events that we, um, or engagements that we uh, tried out that were maybe unique and, and innovative in some way after we went through the initial phase of finding the new normal. Um, so I think it would be useful to, to focus on, on those. Um, we had a house day, we tried an online assembly, and last week we had something we called NIST, NIST Olympics. 
Um, so those are useful kind of case studies that other schools might be able to draw on a little bit. Um, for our house day, basically, um, we have uh, we have six houses at the school. So when a family joins the school, um, they're given one of these six colors, um, which they keep throughout their time at the school. And this is kind of like a, um, a way to reorganize uh, students across uh, classes and year levels when we are going to engage in school spirit events and other um, opportunities to come together as a school. One of the challenges that we've experienced, and I'm sure many schools experience the same thing, is this challenge of trying to sustain a sense of community and enhance connection and a feeling of belonging for our students. It really um, addresses students' sense of well-being. It's at the core of what makes us human. And uh, having people not physically together in a space really makes that challenging. So this house day was, was a way of uh, trying to address that. So um, once the pandemic started and the campus closed, our opportunities to bring children together like this really you know, came to a full stop very suddenly. And uh, what we saw was that we had some capacity built with, um, with all of the skills and attitudes and dispositions, especially those related to ICT. Um, and, and we found some sense of routine in how we were starting, we were, we were doing things with online learning. So we thought, Okay, now's the time to shift to how can we get creative? How can we innovate? How can we leverage this capacity? Um, so what we did was we had our um, assistant teachers and um, our support staff all offer some online activities that went live. Um, they were broken up into three age groups. Um, and so children could get in and, and choose between four or five, maybe six activities at any one time join along with their peers in different classes and different age groups to do just something fun. So they were doing yoga, dance, uh, football skills, origami, cooking, um, all kinds of things you'd see typically done as extracurricular activities, but this took the whole day. Um, so it was really interesting to see how positively the children engaged with these. It really broke up the routine of the day-to-day, -day, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, online learning, uh, you know, eight, nine weeks in, children were, kind, were getting to this sense of fatigue, parents too. Um, so I think one of the really positive bits of feedback where parents felt like, okay, we could kind of like go hands off today, let the kids engage in these activities, have fun, feel like they're getting together with their, uh, with their peers and in, in ways that they hadn't uh, had the opportunities to in the previous weeks. Um, and an added benefit there was that uh, we, we were able to create some time and space for our homeroom teachers who are really, who have been super busy working very, very hard. So we actually gave them the time to, um, to focus on other things. They were not engaged with the students on this day. And some of our support staff were really able to, to come through and shine and show some of their extra skills. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time left, so I don't know. Kyle, let me jump in real quick here. Um, yeah. I think what's uh, interesting, we should note here is that actually when, when Kyle's talking about these things, he's actually talking about sort of models of implementation. And so this house day model that we use actually is a, is a model that we use for professional learning for teachers. And so we have a teachers teaching teachers uh, model that we use at our school to build capacity and leverage the the knowledge and skills that we have in-house. And so when coronavirus hit, we actually shifted that model to an online model. And so we basically replicated the model of how that would work with students. And so the, 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 the way we structured the day is the same as we structured our professional learning day. And so like um, Kyle mentioned earlier, we're not really trying new things where we're going out and finding new um, new, new tools maybe. We're actually using the tools that we currently already have in our toolbox and finding innovative ways to, to use those to address sort of the concerns that we have. Um, so I think that was interesting to know. Another thing that he mentioned was space. And so our leadership has done a really good job of creating space for these things to take place. So they created space within the curriculum. They created space within the schedule. Uh, they've also created space, Kyle mentioned the NIST Olympics. And so our head of PE, Marcus, you know, had heard about this idea that another school had done. And so 
he came to me and asked me, you know, what do you think about this? Do you think we can do this? You know, and I said, of course we can do this. Let's get on a call. So we got on a call. We talked to some other people who had done similar things, but he had the space professionally to take the lead on this because we have a distributed leadership model, right? So he had the knowledge and skills to, to address this or try to address it. He had the space to talk to me. Leadership created the space within the curriculum because they you know, took the foot off the gas pedal of the academic side of things, right? So it's it, sort of, if you think about this idea of space, we, we had time, space within the schedule, space within Marcus was able to step up, space within our community, sort of like everybody had buy-in, everybody participated. So this NIST Olympics was actually a community-wide event. So parents were participating as well. So we, we, we took like Flipgrid, we took, you know, the Google Apps suite, NIST sites, all these things that we use all the time, and we just put them together in a new way. So it wasn't, it was innovative in, in that we hadn't done it before, and, and we co sort of built on the ideas that other people had done, uh, and, and sort of took it to new heights, I think is pretty exciting. But it wasn't like we went out and found some newfangled thing, you know, and, and the PE team leveraged the tools that they're using in new ways as well within the week. So I think the, the space idea is, 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 uh, is one that I think we should think about, you know, mm -hmm. and, and pay, pay attention to is also, you know, letting people step up. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I know my folks are, are dying to know what NIST Olympics is. So you mentioned it, but you haven't told us like what happened. <laughs> okay. So the, the tagline for the, for the week was that NIST Olympics celebrates health and wellness by bringing the NIST community together in the spirit of fun and active living. So it was an event where we were trying to get people, uh, trying to you know, harness this sense of togetherness, coming together and doing one thing, sharing events. So, so being able to engage in these activities organized by our PE team at, a, at different levels that people are comfortable with and engaging their families or their siblings or moms and dads and then sharing them in videos on Flipgrid with the rest of the community was a way to, to just bring people together, to have some fun, to celebrate active living and health. And it came on the back like two weeks prior having this house day. And I think one of the things that that we learned from this is that it was an opportunity to, to communicate clearly with our community, with our parents who don't always see this, that education is about more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. They see their children engaging in these activities where they come together, they feel the sense of connection and belonging, they have fun, and then they're ready to learn. You know, the, I'm sure that the, the Monday after these events, children approach their learning with a different kind of um, yes. with a different kind of mindset and they're more prepared that they they're more content and they're more ready to engage so um, NIST Olympics was a physical activity oriented event but it sent some very important messages about what we what we consider important about educating the whole child and this having a, a holistic approach to education um, I think that in the longer run, we're going to see some real benefits with parents in our community understanding better the work that we do and that it's about more than, um, you know, learning phonics and uh, numeracy and things. And those are important. Like, I don't yeah, want to deviate right. them. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, but we're making some interesting and important gains here that we didn't anticipate at the outset, which I think are, is going to serve us really well in the long run. Very cool. Ben, what were a couple quick events in this Olympics, just so people have a sense? Okay, so uh, the way it was structured is uh, it was sort of um, by group. So early years, middle, middle elementary, upper elementary. And the PE department made these amazing videos at levels one, two, and three. And so kids could engage at whichever level they wanted to, right? Uh, so one was like a bottle flip challenge. And then the bottle flip challenge had three levels, right? And so it got, it got to this insane thing, you know, which was like, they said it was like level 100. There was ball, ball, ball skills. Our PE department uses this really cool app where, you know, kids look at the iPad and then little things pop up on the screen and they have to hit them. So they're moving around. <laughs> so that was sort of leveled. So the kids do this and, and they get points. And for every family member, they get points for each of those family members. So then they submit a form. It's all done by house. Yeah. So we have like a daily, you know, total. So it's sort of like putting a light competition into it. Cool. Um, like they're they're doing like grade level flip grids. So all the kids are in there submitting their flip grids, but they're all watching right, each right. other's flip grids. So we had like, you know, 300 something hours of video. 
And if you think about it, like the videos they submit are only 45 seconds long, <laughs> right, right. right? And so like, and, and they love being in there, seeing their friends, you know, and, and they were, if you could see these videos, our, our uh, Marcus was making highlight reels from every day that the kids were watching to get pumped for the next day. It's like, it's absolutely amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I love it. And I love sort of featuring the, the physical education aspect of this and the health aspect of this and the social emotional aspect of this, because a lot of schools have really struggled to do that. So I appreciate you all sharing. Um, as you head into the next few months, uh, challenges, considerations, anything else that you want to share here before we wind up? Um, I think the, the one of the biggest challenges we've had, you alluded to in, in, at the beginning here, is, is like, um, you know, this reliance on a medium of learning that doesn't match with what we would do at school. You know, there's this childcare function, which we don't always um, uh, consider at, at the forefront and the most important aspirational aspects of our, of our work, right? We, we think about like, we're, we want to impact society positively. Parents are really concerned with childcare, you know, having somebody uh, take care of their kids and we can't replace that at home, right? We can't send a teacher into the house to take care of their kids for the day. That is a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge. Uh, parents who want and expect uh, synchronous online learning for their children when they're four or five years old, um, it's not a realistic expectation. So we really have to do some work with educating um, our parents about what it is we do and why we do it and how they can find um, adequate substitutes with our assistance um, at home. And yeah, I think what it comes down to is if we believe uh, in that social constructivism as the, the, the main paradigm that we're working within, but parents are expecting children to sit in front of a computer and learn in isolation, then we have a real mismatch. So we're going to have to work on that. Um, that's about educating our entire community about what we believe and why we believe it. So that, that will continue to be a big challenge. Um, we're hoping that we um, will soon start moving to reopening for um, August, but we don't know what that looks like because we're in an unpredictable environment. So like all schools, dealing with that unpredictability will continue to be a, a challenge. And all we can do is try to um, put as many contingency plans in place using um, as much information um, we can gather as possible, which doesn't provide a lot of like simple <laughs> solutions for your, your audience, of yeah, course, but of course. Uh, we need I to think, frame it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I could add just something here too. So I, I kind of stumbled on something the other day and it really kind of reminded me of, you know, you kind of want to, you know, we, we're getting a lot of input from parents, right? And it's, and it's hard not to let that sort of influence our behavior in some sense, right? But I think at this time, especially, you really have to set your goal and communicate your goal very clearly and then communicate the steps you're taking to accomplish that goal. And then you trans, then you communicate your, you know, your progress toward that goal right. with these markers, right? And so data is something that you, you have to, to, to gather. And data comes in like, a million different forms it's not always numbers it could be pictures that kids draw you know like when i learned that it blew my mind but one thing i noticed um the other day i was i was in we, we use seesaw right and i noticed that right around the beginning of april almost on april 1st we had a shift in we have like uh you can see like how many likes you know it's like a graph and then how much uh comments right. and right around april 1st we had a shift where comments for the first time ever outpaced likes and so what that meant is our teachers are actually giving more feedback than ever before. So kids are getting detailed feedback every day on their learning that they can actually go back and listen to over and over again to help them refine their, their learning. So I think, you know, from what I hear is students are getting more feedback than ever before and it's more directed specific to them. So I think like, these are the little things we need to start teasing out a little bit more to show the successes and the hard work that our, that our teachers are, are doing. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. I understand. Communication is everything, you know, that's going to help us tremendously if we can be open and honest and, and share um, as much as we can with parents and, and as well as providing that feedback to, to the kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, this is fantastic. Everybody NIST, It's an amazing school. Hope you get to go to Bangkok, Thailand sometime and see it in action. Kyle and Ben, Good thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Scott.
Thanks, Scott. Have a great day. Thanks.